they gave him the opportunity to work with Ye, and he gave me the call. And he was like, yo, Mike, you want to you know, work on this? So I got to be a part of that camp. I know plenty of independent artists were getting a million plus streams per song, but they, they felt like their catalog was worthless. But no, like you got 10 with him and every one of those 10 hit a million. And then you have a few more with these small independent guys that each hit 500,000. So all those streams start to add up. So if you're getting a placement every single week with an independent artist and those independent artists have like at least 100,000, 200,000 monthly listeners, especially if you own 50%, then you, I mean, you're talking like, at least seven hundred dollars per record from from spotify and then you add on apple you might be getting fourteen hundred dollars per record and you have a hundred records with independent artists that are all like that you're doing pretty well for yourself before we jump into this interview and you learn from a best-selling author and an absolute expert in the publishing business if you're doing less than a thousand bucks a month in your business then it's not a production problem, it's a process problem. So if you wanna avoid posting your beats on YouTube and only getting 100 views and not getting any real sales from your beat business, I put together a free training that teaches you the three main lessons I learned that got me to a thousand bucks a week. So go and watch that training, link's in the description or it's gonna be in the pinned comment. So take advantage of that, watch the free training and book a call with me today. Now let's jump into the interview. Hey, what's up guys? So I'm interviewing my manager today and what we're going to be covering is some common things that you may not know about music publishing. He's an expert in this field. So Mike, you've worked with Young Nudie, you're working with Fireman, you work with some members of Kanye's team, which we'll get into later in the interview. But um, but yeah, hopefully that's an introduction that's going to pique some interest from my listeners. So uh, but yeah, is there anything I left off as far as who you're working with right now? Uh, man, made he's going crazy with the weekends team and uh, you know, being a best-selling author. And that's that's the crazy thing about it. So I actually have your guide right here. So music publishers pocket guide. So a lot of gems in there that I've already gone over. And one thing that I left off as well, you manage producers for the most part. Um, so. But in being in that field, what you specialize in, um, other than actually being a musician yourself, is actually in collecting the publishing and negotiating deals and that type of thing. And so I think the first question that I had for you is in terms of like when you're collecting publishing from somebody, what is the main thing that you think a producer is lacking in or money that he's missing out on when they're trying to do a deal by themselves and facilitate that? They're international royalties. Like, I can't tell you how many producers, because, you know, the U.S. only has a little over 300 million people. Uh, we're not even at the 400 million mark versus like India that has 2 billion by itself or the continent of Africa, um, the European Union. Like, there's so many other places outside the U.S. that make up the, our 7 billion population. So it's like, if you're only collecting from one continent, you're not really getting your money. And if, you know, with BMI and ASCAP, like they'll show you international royalties when you're collecting through them, but that's not your real international royalties. Like there's a lot of societies across the like the European Union and Africa and everywhere where there's different types of performance royalties that you can collect in different societies you need to be affiliated with. So it's about 60 percent of your royalty. So, you know, if you're getting, um, you know, like let's say you're, you're getting four thousand dollars here in America quarterly from your BMI or ASCAP, you might be getting six to $8,000 from, you know, these, these other performing rights societies. So you could be making $10,000 annually, uh, quarterly from your royalties, but you're only focused on here in America because, you know, those international societies, they're not easy to get to. Like you gotta know, but you gotta have really, ideally you wanna have a publisher that's gonna go out and get your royalties internationally. And that's the biggest bad people are missing out on because, it's honestly cost you leverage when you go into a deal because let's say you collected your own publishing and you submit your statements and you're like oh well i'm collecting four thousand dollars a month on ascap uh, a quarter on ascap and i'm getting a thousand dollars a month from the mlc and then you pitch the deal and they're like okay they're going to give you an evaluation based off that but if you have those international royalties added to it that bag is completely different got you and, and that's crazy to me because even a lot of producers that follow me and subscribe to this channel from Europe or are international and they're still focused on the US market, they know it's the biggest market in terms of there's all lies on this market, right? But you're saying that 60% of the money 
is actually abroad. So, um, and then in terms of that, is that just publishing or is that everything like master royalties included as well? So I like to stick with what I know. I know the publishing side, so I can say for a fact, yes, on the publishing. I'd imagine it's the same on the master side too, though, because if you're listening to the record, then you're going to get streams from the master. But I just don't know like those societies or how the payout works on the, on the master side too much. Yep. Okay, got you, got you, absolutely. And I know you're a specialist in publishing, but uh, like I said, like you, you play saxophone, uh, piano. Like I remember, whenever we were in Atlanta and you were playing the piano, that one studio, you know, it's crazy to me. But uh, if we're gonna take a step back, like how did you actually get into publishing? Was this when you went to Georgia State University, or what led you to start off on that journey? Yeah, so if if any if you or any of your followers tuned into the Grammys this year, uh, they honored a man by the name of Kendall Minter. And so Kendall Minter, he was my professor at Georgia State. He's a legendary entertainment attorney, which is why he was honored. And he's impacted so many people's careers, mine included. So when I was a student, I took his music publishing course. It was like music publishing and copyright. And I studied under him for a semester. And I was just like, yo, like, this isn't enough time. Like, there's so many more questions I have. Like, taking this class for a semester isn't, like, I'm still confused about publishing. So I'm like, I want to learn more about this. I want to learn more about you. I want to get into this. So I called him over the summer. I'm like, yo, is there any way I can learn more? Can I can I help you with anything? Can I, you need help at the office? And he was like, yeah. And so I started interning for him. And I think that was 20, 2016, 2017. Uh, I started just interning for him over the summer and then it led into the, the school year. But with it, like, I got to see the legal side of publishing. So I got to read producer agreements, contracts. I got to issue takedown notices when people didn't clear records. And I'm talking about we issued a takedown notice and the record would come down in the same day because he just had that direct line. So I really got to see how to protect your copyrights and how to negotiate a deal properly. So once I got immersed in it, and two, uh, that's like during the time where the Music Modernization Act was being worked. So he was like, yo, if you can understand the Music Modernization Act, you'll be one of the most valuable men in music. You'll always have a check in your pocket. So I'm like, oh, OK, I'm going to take my time and I'm going to learn this. And yeah, he, he started my journey. He introduced me to Rico Brooks. Uh, he introduced me to Patrick Moxie, the CEO of Ultra. So he really just launched my career from that point. Dope. No, that's awesome. And I feel like a mentor is an absolute necessity in the music field because everybody's trying to make a name for themselves, but we're not, we're negating the fact that somebody who's already been in the game that long already knows everything about it and they can guide you through and give you that blueprint. Um, now I do have one question for you about the Music Modernization Act. So what should producers know, if anything, about that, or is that applicable to us? The most important thing that y'all need to know from this is you're legally entitled to points on the master, 3.5 to 5%. And that's if the if the artist is signed. If the artist is unsigned, you can get up to 15% of the record. So, and then in order to collect that, right, if you do a record with Sony or Warner or Universal, they have an artist portal. So whatever A&R sent you the producer agreement, you should follow up in the email chain. They'd be like, hey, I want to collect on my master's royalty. Can you send me a login for the artist portal? And if they don't like, typically they'll just send it to you. But if they can't, then they'll point you in the direction of the person who can. And well, they'll put you in an email with the person who can. You can set up your login. But the master's pays significantly more than the, the publishing side pays. So, you know, you're looking at 3.5% uh, on, on the master's side. That's close to the equivalent of 30% of the publishing. So like if you're, well, it'll, it'll pay close to what you would get on 30% of the publishing. So definitely getting your, your side of the master royalty. Cause yeah, sound exchange will pay you for radio, but that's not your actual streaming. Like you need to get in there, get in the artist portal. And another thing most people should know, like I know producers get excited when they make the music video for your record, but if they make the music video for your record, guess what? That came against the artist's advance. So now the artist has to recoup the budget that went towards that video. So that's going to pay you less on the master side because there's more money that the artist needs to recoup before you can even get paid. So that, but that's the biggest thing that you need to take away is that you're legally entitled to points on the master. So every record you do, even is the producers and the engineers, you're entitled to points on the master. And whether or not you get them, like, like you're going to get it, but they're going to like nickel and dime you depending on how many producers are on the record. And 
things of that nature. But if you get you a good attorney, you'll be you'll be taken care of. Got you. Got you. And and I think that there's so many gems in that that I think will go over some people's heads and they'll have to go back and watch this again just to make sure they catch all of them. But in terms in terms of being legally entitled to something, I think that's new for us to hear because a lot of deals that you, if you try to navigate it yourself, you'll see they'll try to lowball you on on the advance, but also on stiffing you on master royalties, publishing that type of thing. And so producers can can lose out on so much money just by ignorance. And so that's why I feel educating ourselves on this topic is necessary if you want to take yourself serious in this industry. So like just making beats is not enough, obviously. But um, but so what what are the main things that you've done like with managing me, uh, but also with managing man made and the other producers on your roster that actually are bringing in money and like maximizing profits? Yeah. So for one, I'm constantly pitching records for sync, uh, talking to music supervisors. Two, I'm out constantly going to the back end to make sure none of my guys are being stolen from because there's a lot of producers out here. Cause like some people will steal from you. Like I don't want to name any companies, but like you'll go in, in the back end and you'll see a claim from a company that nobody on the record is signed to. And you're like, who, 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 you know what I'm saying? Like, like people will definitely steal from you, if, especially if like, like I've, I've talked to some people at certain companies where they'll talk to your manager, they'll talk to the producer and they feel like, oh, oh, this guy's on drugs or this guy is super dumb. Like they're not going to educate you. They're actually going to take advantage of you once they peep like, oh, you're weak. Like, let me just. And they'll walk right over you. Like they think your manager is weak or they think you're weak mentally. Or you don't have a strong team around you. Like they'll steal from you. They'll take advantage of you. And no one on your team will notice because they peep game before they did it. They know who they can mess with and who they can't. So, you know, I, I, I do that. But I'm also constantly just talking to other A&Rs. Like, hey, what are you guys doing? What are you guys working on? Can you need some moves? You need this. I'm talking to other producers too. Like I'll be at a writing camp. I'm like, hey, I got some guitar loops for you. If like, man, especially with you, people know who you are. So I know I was at the Dreamville camp with TNT. And I'm like, man, you got to get some more Kobe loops, man. He was like, Kobe? Man, I ain't heard from him. So I'm like, yeah, I need some Kobe loops. I'm like, what's your number? I'll load you up. Got his number. It hits you. Loaded him up. So just constantly looking for ways to make plays um ways to do swamps like there's other producers that i work with who you know they've given beats for free to the artist and now they co-own the master of those songs with the artist and now we're talking about putting out collaborative projects and things of that nature so you can be like a dj mustard or a mike will made it and have your own project like i said the masters pay significantly more than the publishing pay so you know if you're co-owning this stuff with them 50 50 you're out of here Got you. And so that's with releasing songs with the artist, but having your name on the album as, mm -hmm. a, as an artist. OK, got well, you. Sometimes, right now, they're the project that come out. They're not like it's not going to say the artist and the producer, but on the business side, like, yeah, he's getting compensated. Now, when he actually puts out the project, that's when it's going to be 50 50. But right yeah. now, while we're, we're on the artist to do all the marketing and promotion, it's your record. We're just eating off the master side more than most producers would. Got it. Got it. That makes perfect sense. And there there was something in this guide I read. I'm not going to give it away because I want people to go and read it for themselves. But the way where you can actually get a free verse from the artist and it doesn't cost you anything and it's actually beneficial to both parties. So I thought that that was a major gem that I read about in it. And so one thing I, I want to make this applicable to music producers specifically, because when I got my first placement, I wasn't managed by anybody. I didn't have anybody to guide me through that process. And so what what do you would you recommend for a producer as far as like in order a couple of things that they need to do when they get a placement to make sure they have either legal representation or that they're able to set up a deal in a way that where they're not going to get screwed over? Honestly, for me, I say the first thing you need to do is copyright the beat. Cause I've seen I've been in a lot of situations where a producer will have a have a record and then they'll just pay somebody to redo it and then other producers cut out and they're upset so i was if you copyright the record you can get the baddest attorney in the world because you own the copyright so legally when you win because you can prove that you sent it to them you can prove that you own the copyright and you can prove that whatever producer that uh redid it did a derivative of your original work so you can sue the mess out of the label and they have to pay for your attorney fees because that's when you register the copyright, that's uh, that's why you register copyright. Like you're still entitled to 
by protection, even if you don't register the copyright, but they're not going to be able to cut, like, it's not going to cover legal fees and things of that nature. It's just going to, once the, once you go to court and they prove that it's your record and that you, you were taken advantage of, like, you'll make the money that the record generated after that. But, you know, you might have spent more on lawyer fees, but you pay that $25 to register the copyright up front. Okay, cool. It doesn't matter if y'all remake the beat. I'm going to sue you. You're going to pay me every royalty that this song made, and you're going to pay for my attorney. So I'm going to Google the coldest entertainment attorney in the world, and I'm going to get him to rep the case, and I'll show him, like, hey, I have the copyright of this. They're going to take the case because it's open and shut, especially if it's a hit. If it's a hit record, oh, you have nothing to worry about. So that's one of the things that I highly recommend everybody do is just copyright the record, uh, the beat, even before the paperwork is done, because you don't want them to. Like I've had like low level managers threaten to remake the beat with my guys. And I'm like, I will sue you. I will sue the mess out of you. And whatever I say about you publicly isn't slander. Like I can say this is a dirt bag. They try to take advantage of me and my guys. And it's true. I can prove it. So you don't, you know what I'm saying? So even better since that copyright gives you a whole lot of power. Um, and then when it comes to attorneys, like don't just get an attorney because somebody recommends it. Oh, he got me this deal because, you know, the attorney might not have actually been the one that got them a deal. Like for me, I, like, you know, I got you your deal. And I've done that for a lot of other producers. So it's like, if, if I get, you know what I'm saying? Like if I get somebody a deal, an attorney still has to be involved, like especially with like with a Sony or a Ultra or whoever. Like it's a big label, like they're not going to just send it to me as a manager or the producer. They're going to send it directly to the lawyer, and the lawyer has to negotiate. Um, and oftentimes, the lawyer is just going to ask you for more money. So they might be, like, oh yeah, this attorney got me this deal. The attorney might have been the one who actually got you the deal, and the attorney, you know, they might not have negotiated well for you. Like, like they might have got you a lot of money, but that might not have been a good thing. Um, before you get a lot of money, because now you're stuck in this deal for five years when you could have just been in and out the deal that they gave you the right amount of money you deserved, and then you could have just got another advance from ASCAP or BMI. So definitely, like, don't just take one person's word for an attorney. Like, talk to producers, but talk to managers, talk to other attorneys. Like, another attorney, like, attorneys aren't going to talk bad about each other uh, ever, but because you know that's that's a whole different. They can get sued too. Uh, but if you talk to like a manager, a manager will be straight up like, yeah, I did business with so-and-so and they fumbled the bag. Like we had this offer on the table with so-and-so. We had this offer on the table with Sony for a quarter million and they talked to my lawyer and now they're not talking to us anymore. Like that happens a lot and you'll never hear about it. You'll just hear about, oh, they're in billboards or they got this. So definitely like do your due diligence on whatever attorney you're speaking to. Um, but I say the first and foremost, copyright. Get an attorney, but also get a manager because you want you don't want to get just an attorney because your attorney might act like your manager, especially within entertainment. You need somebody to watch your attorney because you need, you need the attorney to watch your manager and your manager to watch your attorney because people will take advantage of you. So if you have a whole team where everybody's eating off you, but everybody's also making sure you're good. That's the best way to do it. Exactly. OK, got you. So so that is a major, major piece of the puzzle is like actually have some tension instead of just having one party who knows everything because they can still take advantage of you and you wouldn't know anything about it. You know, like as producers, we just don't have the same knowledge and background. And you mentioned being stuck in a bad deal. We're going to get into that in a second. But um, I think the first thing that I want to talk about is like when you, you structure the Rod Wave deal for me, like you made sure that there was master points on there. We collected some micro sync royalties and we got an advance, but also in in your guide you also talk about not necessarily uh in advance is not necessarily the greatest thing for a producer so walk me through like why or, or what situation would be a situation where you wouldn't take an advance and that would actually lead to making more money yeah so like this is a really big gym i feel like i i, I you know what i'm saying like this might be some premium content charge somebody 25 dollars to hear this part but you can ask for a non-recoupable advance. So it's completely possible to ask for an advance that doesn't come out of your side of the masters or anything. It's just like, this is not recoupable. Here's $5,000. Just like, like we're going to take that to the chin. Uh, that's a type of advance that you can get that most people don't negotiate. Um, but it's also like, like I said, like the advance is you're really because like so you're legally entitled to the master so your advance isn't your advance on the publishing side you're going to get that automatically it's your advance on the master so if you don't take an advance on the master you just start making master like immediately it versus like okay well this record you're getting 3.5 percent of the master 
uh, and this artist, you know, for this, let's just make it simple. Like for this record, the label spent a hundred thousand dollars on the on, on the record, so the record has to make that hundred thousand dollars back first. And after they make the hundred thousand dollars back first, now you start getting money. But if you don't take an advance, like it's a little easier, especially if you make your advance not recoupable or you make your master points uh, not recoupable, like structure in a way where it doesn't matter if the artist took an advance, you just get paid immediately. But yeah, you're getting an advance on the master side. So if it's an artist who you know, like, oh, this is going to be a hit. Oh, this is going to go crazy. Like, man, I don't need that advance. I'm going to start collecting that money right away. But if it's somebody who you're like, uh, I don't even know if this guy's going to get 10,000 streams. Like, go ahead and take that that money up front. Uh, but that, that's on, uh, that's on, like, just a producer advance. Um, yeah, if you get an advance on your pub, uh, co-pub or you get an advance on your admin, that's different, too. Because on co-pub, like... I wouldn't want a half million dollar advance if I don't think I'm going to make because one, you're going to have to make a million dollars to recoup that back because now you're going to you took a half million dollar advance. I need to make a half million dollars to break even. No, you need to make a million because only 50 percent of what you make is counting towards what you owe. So I gave you a hundred. I gave you half a million dollars, but I just bought 50 percent of basically how you make your money. So now for every dollar you make, you only get 50 cents. So you made that million. OK, now you've recouped. You might not make that million ever. And when, when they see you getting closer, here's another advance. And then you're just forever in debt. But I've seen other producers where they're just getting this money straight up. And now they can go to a bank, which will give you way more money than a label at a much better interest rate. So you can go to a bank and get a line of credit, especially if you own yourself outright. Well, now I can go to a Northern Trust Bank or a City National Bank who... No, Northern, Northern Trust, they have an entertainment division. I know one of the VPs over there, City National Bank, they were built off the entertainment industry. They're really big in California. So they'll both give you a line of credit based off your advances. But if you owe, but if, you know, let's say Sony has 50% of your stuff, then it, it looks a little different versus you just owning it outright. Sony cutting you a check every month. Like that feels good. Like when you've got your, your, your publisher cutting you a check regularly, and you know, like they're on it, they're collecting all your money internationally. And then you go to a bank and you see they see a credible organizations that's cutting you a check regularly. And it's like, okay, cool. Now instead of taking this deal where 50 cents on every dollar is theirs, I'm in this deal where the bank's only getting 10 cents on every dollar. And that's, that's a whole lot better. You can do a whole lot more with your money. Um, and like I said, you can still get an ASCAP advance and BMI advance, like there, there's so many different ways to like leverage your stuff. But if you just give it all away, it's I'm not going to say it's bad, but it's just like you have to be realistic with how well you think the record's going to do and how you want to structure everything. Cool, cool. And so and, and I think like a lot of producers, we start off just thinking like all the money we have to make has to come from music. We don't actually think about I guess the, the one third word I'm thinking of right now is just leveraging whatever we have so that we can make more money off of that money. And so um, I guess when, whenever you talk about like an ASCAP and a BMI advance specifically, that's something that I'm not even familiar with. So so walk me through like, what is what does that look like and why would that happen and take place? Yeah, so like, let's say you're getting 10,000 a quarter from it. Sometimes they'll just offer it to you. Like if you're really doing well, like your rep might just give you a call or shoot you an email. Uh, and they'll offer you one, but you can also talk to your rep because uh, I have a client who he got a sizable check from I, I can't remember if it was ASCAP or BMI, but he got a sizable check from him. But they offered it to him like he was making all these royalties and we were talking to the rep. And he was like, man, like he was he was trying to see if the rep could help him get a deal with the publisher and things of that nature. And they're like, man, if you really need some money, we can we can give you an advance. He was like, what? And he's like, yeah, he's like, do you want this amount or this amount? And he took the lower amount. In that situation, I'm like, yo, you should take the higher amount because it's it's ASCAP, it's BMI. So it's like, you know what I'm saying? It's a it's a little different. But yeah, you can talk to your rep and they'll give you an advance off your writer share. And if you own your publishing, they can give you an advance off of that too. But you know, you were always on your writer side outright. Um, so yeah, they can give you an advance against that and just help you be comfortable for a little while. So you don't have to just take a deal with a publisher. You have to be making a certain amount. I don't know the minimum, but um, I say I say the minimum they'll give out is like fifty thousand. I haven't heard of them giving any lower than fifty thousand. That's crazy. That's crazy, and that that's not a small chunk of change 
as well. You know, and you mentioned like taking the higher amount in that in that case, because it's like you you don't want to be stuck in a publishing deal for forever because they're going to be taking, like you said, 50 percent of its co-publishing. But in terms of ASCAP, we're going to continue to use them, you know, in mm -hmm. perpetuity, essentially. So I see why you're saying that makes sense. But uh, we're talking about a lot of advanced stuff. And so for somebody who's just coming into the game and they may not know the difference between any kind of royalties, they thought like, oh, what I'm getting from Spotify, I just call that a streaming royalty. They may not know anything between mechanical and whatnot. So um, if somebody wants to know the difference between writers and publishers, then walk me through what that looks like. And is the producer entitled to a writer share as well, even though they're not technically writing the lyrics to a song. Yeah, so producers are writers. Like, like even when you register a song, like whether it's ASCAP or BMI, there's no slot that says producer. It says composer or it says writer. Uh, it'll say composer, it'll say author. But, you know, composer, because ultimately like music, like publishing, well, publishing existed. It's the first form of the music business. Like when music became a business, it was publishing because we didn't have radios back in the 1800s. We didn't have cars, CD players, MP3 players, any of that. There was no such thing as streaming. How did people listen to music? You would go to an orchestra, you go to a concert, you go to church, and you would hear the music live. Where did that music come from? Compositions. What are compositions when somebody physically writes out the music, like they score the music? And so that's why you're a composer or you're an author. You either compose the beat, the, the, the music behind it, or you wrote the lyrics as an author. So when you register your records, you're either a composer or an author, but there's like no spot that says producer. But either way, like whether you compose music or you write the lyrics, you're still writing. Like, like you're still back then, you're physically like writing out the music. So you're all considered writers, whether you made the beat or actually wrote on it. Um, and there's a whole lot of other rights that I don't want to get into that are you're entitled to just being a writer. Um but yeah, so you're whether you're a producer or a writer, you're 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 a writer. So you're gonna get your writer's share of the record. So if you produced it, um, like you're gonna get fifty percent, and then the actual author is gonna get fifty percent. Uh, and that's just how that. So sometimes the artist actually wrote their own lyrics, so the artist will get their fifty percent, and the producer will get their fifty percent, and that's your master side. But you're also gonna get fifty percent of the pub as well. Um, now, if you are like a fireman who both writes and produces. He's getting 100 percent of some of these records because he wrote the entire record. He produced the entire record. But that's not really attractive to artists because it's like, well, if I do this record with him, I'm not getting any publishing from it. So it's like, OK, in those situations, like I think there was a woman who just complained recently about how Beyonce took uh, writing credit on her record or all these other. But that's like that's just good business. It's like if you want to work in this, you got to make it appealing to the artist too. the artist wants publishing. Like you're using, you're eating off them and their brand and their name. Like you put that song out yourself. You're not going to do a billion streams. They'll do it and you can write it and you can do the beat and they'll give you your full credit. But hey, I want to take 10% of this. I want to take 20% of this. And you really shouldn't put the artist in a position where they have to ask for it. You should just offer it to them. Like, hey, I'll write this record for you and I'll produce this record for you. And sometimes it makes more, if it's a Beyonce and my, my guy wrote and produced a record, We'll give Beyonce all the writing credit and we'll just take the production credit. So we'll split the record 50 50. She gets half the pub, we get half the pub, she gets half the writing, we get half the writing. Um, so it just makes sense, but it just depends on your business acumen because in, in, in the music business, sometimes people get a little sensitive and egos will get big, but you got to think of who is the better vessel for this? Who, who, who does this really belong to? Like, yeah. I wrote and produced this and I could put it out myself, but I'll put it like, I've seen writers and, and producers put records out themselves and other writing producers just steal it. Like they'll copy the sample that they did and they'll just do a derivative of the lyrics. And now you have to sue them. And this is, this is a whole different thing. But if the artist is big enough, like they can beat you in litigation. So it, it's just, especially if you don't have a copyright, like, so it, 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 I forgot where we even started with this. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and that makes perfect sense. Like, I appreciate that because sometimes it's not about like, you know, you can charge five, ten thousand 10,000 for a record as a producer. Sometimes if the record doesn't come out, nobody eats. And so like having that wherewithal to know how to negotiate a thing so that you can not step on somebody's toes and make sure the record comes out, I think is, is one thing that you specialize in. And I, I do want to ask you some tips on networking 
at some point because I think that that would be beneficial for somebody who's trying to network in person and they've only networked before online. But uh, but you you have worked with some members of Kanye's team, which is massive. So so what exactly was the value that you're offering to them and what got your foot in the door with that opportunity? Man, I, I say his name in every interview I do. My, my brother, Kyle Campbell, uh, he's Cortez Bryant's mentee. He gets a lot of opportunities. So uh, they gave him the opportunity to work with Ye and he gave me the call and he was like, yo, Mike, you wanna you know work on this? So I got to be a part of that camp. Um, and while I was at that camp, like a lot of the people had questions about publishing. It's like, yo, I'm about to have these, these records with Ye, I'm, I'm gonna need a publishing deal. Uh, I need to understand publishing. Well, I'm a master of publishing. A lot of people don't know publishing and like they'll pretend to know, but nobody's stupid. Like you can tell when somebody doesn't know what they're talking about. You can ask them certain questions and they're like, uh, you didn't sound too confident. You said, um, way too many times. You, you know what I'm saying? Like you just know when people know their stuff and when people don't. And so with me at the highest level, when you're in the room with the biggest artists in the world, I know myself. I'm not intimidated. Like I can add value to you, 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 everybody. Like, what's up? Get my number. Talk to me. So I got lucky, though, because I mean, I'm from Illinois. So when I connected with Fire, he saw the zip code. He was like, hold on. That's Marion. I'm like, yep. He was like, man, my people went to Carbondale. I'm like, my mom went to Carbondale. He was like, nah. And we just connected off of that. And so he he wanted to find somebody who can get him a publishing deal. I've done millions of dollars in publishing deals with Ultra. So I'm like, yo, I can make that phone call today. And I did. Um, and ultimately he didn't go with them. He went with Sony, but I also had a, uh, Mike Jackson was still there at the time. And I had a great relationship relationship with Mike Jackson, the vice president of Sony. So I just, I have so many relate. Uh, I just, I just had so much knowledge about what they needed that's valuable to producers, uh, like knowledge from a publishing perspective and knowledge, knowledge from a manager perspective. And like, I'm young. So I'm not stuck in my ways. I don't think I know everything. I read every day. And there's plenty of guys that read every day that still don't know what I know because when you read stuff, not everything you read might be true. So you got to apply it in real life. When you apply stuff in real life, it's like, oh, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. That's not really it. Like, like you see what's real, what's not real, what's fluff. Like, I read everything you need to know about the music business. I read that book several times, but I'm like, a lot of this stuff about publishing isn't really applicable. Like, I don't know how to actually collect this world. So you say a derivative uh, is a form that you can get paid. Well, how do I get paid from a derivative? Oh, the derivative is, is, is essentially like a sample or you remade something. So it's not a different form of payment. It's just like you got to like really like but if you just read a book, you're going to like this about nonsense. But when you actually like live it and you do it, it's like, OK, this doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. Like I've read some things about publishing where they're like, oh, there's two sides to a record. There's a the the sound recording and the composition. But I'm like, we're talking about publishing. We don't need to talk about the sound recording. It's publishing. So we're going to focus on the composition. So how many ways can I get paid from the composition? What countries pay on the composition? What are the rates on the composition? You talk to a book before I put my book out, you there was hundreds of older executives saying nobody knows the streaming rates are made up. No, the streaming rates are public knowledge. They're on the MLC. The MLC is government owned. So essentially, you can say the United States government sets the streaming rates and you can go see them and they change every single month. So, but people just spout nonsense. That's crazy to me. So um, and, and that I think that's important, like with being a lifelong learner, like you can see, like I got books behind me. It's like I love to read or at least I'm putting on a podcast or that type of thing. But I think you get to a certain point where it's either information overload or you become a judge to where you can tell if something's right or wrong just based on what you have set in stone or you can unlearn something. I think that's a superpower that like you have, you know, so so it's going to help you to to elevate your craft for sure. And so like in, in terms of networking in person and making a good first impression, like let's say let's say you go to a networking event or you're in the studio trying to get some new connects. What are three things that you think somebody should do to make a good first impression and get an extra contact in their number or in their phone book? The biggest thing I've learned is just be yourself. Cause like there's so many like weird people in the industry who will like like shift their energy and like I know guys who read acting books on on like on just like how to smile and how to shake a hand and read psychology books on the best way to approach people. And if you do all that, like you might fool some people, 
but you're not going to fool everybody. And the people who understand like, oh, you're trying to manipulate me right now. You're trying to really force me to like you. Like, I really don't like you and I don't trust you and you're really sketchy to me. And they're not going to say it to your face, but they're just not going to have you around. They're not going to like when you are around. They might leave the room when you come around and you don't even understand why they're doing it. But it's because like you're fake. Like, just be genuine because ultimately, like, you don't want to pretend and then get around somebody and you're around them. Like, like as a manager, I'm around, like, you don't live here, but you live here. I'll be around you a lot. Like, I'm around, I was with Man Made yesterday. I was with Five Man the week before that. And we might spend two or three days together. And it's like, if I pretend to be something that I'm not and I'm, I'll am i be around you for days at a time, like, we're both going to be uncomfortable and that relationship's not going to last. But, you know, I've been with Man Made since 2020 and we're here in 2024. I've been with, with five minutes since 2022. We're here in 2024. And because I just, I was myself, I was genuine. So I say that's number one, be yourself, be genuine, be authentic Two, know what you bring to the table. Like you can't just like, Hey, uh, is, we, we let's find a way to work together. Like, why should I find a way for us to work together? Like you should come to me and be like, Hey Mike, you know, I've been following your page and your brand. I love your book, but did you ever think about doing X, Y, Z? I, I have a relationship over here. And if you're interested, I can set up a meeting or introduction between you and so-and-so. Oh yeah, man, give my number, please. Like if you come to me and you add value, I'm going to give you my number. I'm eager. I'm waiting for your call. Like, oh man, this guy told me he could help my book sell a thousand more copies and you can actually do it. Like don't say you can do something. You can't do it. Like in Atlanta, like a lot of people will do that. Like they'll just try to finesse. Like, oh, I'm going to figure it out. And you kill your reputation. Like, no, it's like, okay, I actually know what I bring to the table because I've done this. So when I was at in, in, uh, Kanye's camp, I've already collected royalties for Young Nudie and Lotto and Gunna and Turbo and all these big guys. So it's like, I know publishing. I'm, I'm not just a guy who read about it. I actually collected royalties. I've gotten a lot of people paid. So, okay, I, I can help you get paid. I've also closed a lot of deals. So I can help you get a deal. I've negotiated, so I can help you negotiate. So it's like, I've already done this stuff, so I'm, I know what I'm walking into here with. I know what value I add. I'm telling you what value I bring, and I show you. I prove it. And now it's like, okay, cool. Hey, yo, y'all meet Mike. And that's, that's the thing. Like, once you're yourself, you know what you bring to your table, people will introduce you. But if no one willingly introdu introduces you, you know, you, you should at least know two to three people in the room. Like, for me, before I go network anywhere... I, I research like oh, okay, this is the ASCAP event. Who works at ASCAP Atlanta? This is BMI event. Who works at BMI Atlanta? What's their Instagram? Who follows them? What mutuals do we have in common? Hey, do you know Mitch? Hey, do you know Mar Marche? Hey, do you know Jason Riddick? Okay, cool. What is he like? Well, oh, Jason went to Georgia State. Cool. Well, I meet Jason. I, I have a way to connect with Jason. Oh, you actually have a good relationship with Jason? All right, cool. Are you going to the ASCAP event? All right, cool. Can you introduce me to Jason when we get there? Boom. Before I even meet this man, I know where he went to school with. I have my talking points. I know what value I'm going to bring to him. I already have somebody to introduce me. And now it is a whole much smoother process. But you can't just like, uh, I'm going to go to this event. I'm going to figure it out. Like, no, because a guy like me, I'm a clean house. And you're going to be sitting there like, wow, how did that guy do that? I was the most prepared in the room. And, and that's what I'm getting the most from this is that you have to be super intentional about making a contact, coming in contact with somebody that you actually want to network with. And so when you talk about having value that comes to the table, you can be a specialist in the area. But more so than that, like what you've done is actually doing the thing, spending time under the bar so to speak. And so like, that's what's going to give you an edge. Like you're saying, like if somebody's stuttering a lot and they're trying to present themselves as an expert, people are going to see through that. So, so be yourself. So you make a strong first impression. I like that. Um, so, so what do you, what do you think about, uh, do you think that producers are too short sighted in terms of like trying to get to the short money? Uh, you know, I, I know you talked about like a lot of artists, even, you know, making, what you call microwavable music but mm -hmm. like in terms of producers like do you feel do you feel like we're not being unique enough or do you feel like uh producers are just trying to get a placement instead of trying to come out with something that's going to have a legacy and be long lasting i feel like producers are too bougie like for me you're a musician do you ever listen to just instrumentals no <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Um, well, in terms of, oh, you're saying in terms of just instrumentals? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I listen to a lot of jazz. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, like, I listen to jazz. I listen to, like, alternative rock where it's just guitars. I listen to brass tracks where some of their songs are just trumpets, and they got millions and millions of streams. So it's like, as a producer, 
you could put out a beat by itself. And I've seen beats that are just beats, just instrumentals with 100 million plus views on YouTube. And you can clean house with that. But there's producers like, nah, if you can get my beat from YouTube, that makes it cheap. Man, I was working with a film company. I was working with a film director. And he saw a guy's beat on YouTube and he paid him $10,000 for it. And he let him keep it up on YouTube. He's like, yo, just you can't let anybody else use this beat. You can keep it up on YouTube. I don't care. But this isn't going to be in anybody else's film. There's not going to be a rapper rapping over it. I'm buying the rights to this. You can leave it up on YouTube, though. You're just denying yourself exposure and money. It's like YouTube, you're getting paid to expose yourself. You're getting paid to build your brand. And a lot of producers, they just don't do it. It's like, well, somebody's going to steal my sound. Well, somebody's going to steal your sound when the record comes out, too. So it's just like, but that, that record is one record where you're only getting the publishing and a small piece of the master versus... If you go with the, you put out the record out yourself, well, now you have an instrumental album. Well, now movie directors are calling you. Hey, Kobe, I'll give you $10,000 for this record. Cool. This is one of a thousand records that I have. And there might be a hundred plus more movie directors that call you and expand your catalog being there. And somebody can follow you and go through your music and they might freestyle. I know my cousin would go through uh, YouTube all the time, just freestyle over beats. I've been in plenty of sessions where people would just YouTube and, and take a beat and if nobody in the session has a beat that's harder, that YouTube producer just got a placement. And people like, oh, like, like producers are just too egocentric. Like even like I, I've talked to producers and it's like, oh, oh, he's not a producer. He's a loop maker. I'm like, bro, you are all producers. And if anything, he's more talented than you. If you're trying to be disrespectful, you're saying he's a loop maker. He's a musician that's been doing this for 10 years. And that loop that you're taking from him is going to be the melody to the song. So he's making the melody to the song that the rapper is going to copy and get his flow from. And he's setting the the the, the actual tempo of the song with his melody. Like, like he's really the mastermind behind this whole record. But you want to disrespect him and call him a loop maker. Like he's not a term of endearment. You're just trying to belittle this guy. It's like, no, he's a producer. Just like you're a producer. And you can't make this record without him. He could probably make this record without you because the melody is the most important part. Like... It's just, it is what it is. I like, yay, like, if you listen to his stuff, he doesn't have drums on some of his stuff. On a lot of his stuff, it's just like that melody, that that those chords that move and it sounds big. So it's like, yo, to this guy, you're a loop maker, but you work with someone like, yay, it's like, you're the producer. So I just feel like producers like get too caught up in like their egos. Some of them try to act like divas. I've dropped clients on, on the management side because they're just like, I'm not doing this and I'm not doing this and I'm not doing this and I'm too big for this. I'm like, Respectfully, sir, you're a nobody. You're not Metro. You're not Sunny. You're not DJ Mustard. Like, yeah, you got a placement or two, but there's a ten thousand other producers that got a placement or two. Like, be kind, be humble, be easy to work with, be coachable, and you'll do all right. That's great advice. That's great advice. I th I think being humble will definitely take you far. And like like we were talking about earlier, like having an ego about things is going to blow up relationships and. You're going to miss out on opportunities because of that. Um, now, now I do want to talk about something that's not really uh, well known, I guess, in our space. In terms of when I signed an admin deal with Rico, um, what he was talking about was actually leveraging placements uh, with independent artists. And so can you talk a little bit about how independent artist placements can add up and actually stack that value and, and flip it and leverage it into a publishing deal. Yeah, because like independent artists, like a lot of them, they just it's a it's another ego thing. It's like I know plenty of independent artists who are getting a million plus streams per song. And I know producers who I try to get them a deal and they're like, nah, nah, I don't I only got like they had 300 records and most of them were at 250 plus streams. But they they felt like their catalog was worthless. But no, like if you have like you got to think like most of these producers who have these big streams is like all oh, these these big deals is like they might have got just one record that hit a hundred million streams. But you have this independent artist here, and you got ten with him, and all every one of those ten hit a million. And then you got one with this big guy that hit ten million by itself. And then you have a few more with these small independent guys that each hit five hundred thousand. So all those streams start to add up. So if you're getting a placement every single week with an independent artist and those independent artists have you know a million plus like at least a hundred thousand two hundred thousand monthly listeners and they they have records with you that are hitting a million plus streams like 
Like that's some money, especially if you own fifty percent of the record. Then you, I mean, you're talking like at least seven hundred dollars per record from from Spotify, and then you add on Apple, you might be getting fourteen hundred dollars per record from from the streaming royalties. So if we're looking at fourteen hundred dollars per per record that you have with this independent artist, and you have a hundred records with independent artists that are all like that, you're doing pretty well for yourself. Got it, got it. And so, like, I think I remember it because uh, when when uh, Kino, I was hanging out with Kino in L.A., but he was talking about an interview how those pennies add up. And so, like, making sure that you collect publishing on everything is massive. Um, and so, I do have one question for you as well before we head up and wrap up the, the interview. So, in terms of producers passing up on long term money and taking upfront money, maybe for like selling a loop pack on Splice or something like that, or just giving a beat away to get an advance. Uh, when they do that royalty free, do you think that there's an advantage to doing that a certain way? Or do you think that they are missing out majorly on the back end and collecting there? So that's the thing. A lot of those aren't actually royalty free. Like when they say royalty free, they're talking about the master side, but uh, well, it depends on the platform. But I know there was, for a fact, there was one record that one of my clients had that got really, really big. And he took a sample from uh, I can't remember what website he he did it on, but he took a sample from a website. And when the lawyer went through it, the lawyer told us they're like, yeah, so this isn't actually royalty free. This is just saying you don't have to give them any royalties on the master side. They're still entitled to the publishing. So you you can still like, like I said, I don't I would have to actually see the agreement. But yeah, you're not necessarily giving up your publishing on it. And you're always, like I said, you're always entitled to your writer side. So you're never giving away your writer side either. So I wouldn't say you're, you're missing out on money. You just have to like actually like know the terms and conditions that you're agreeing to when you put yourself up there to see what rights are you giving away and what rights do you retain. Got it. it I mean, that sheds a lot of light on things, you know, for sure. And so, so what I'm getting the most out of this is like, you're going to have to know exactly what's in those agreements, read the fine print. Um, you know, and I know like whenever I started looking at contracts for the first time, you know, and it's like, I can't speak legally. So I definitely advise um, with hiring somebody who is an entertainment attorney for sure to handle that. Um, but but yeah, to, to wrap up, man, I really appreciate you sharing all of this knowledge because it's going to impact a lot of people. But I feel like this was this was one of the best purchases I made all year, like hands down. And so what I want people to do is to either grab this or hit you up for more information. So if somebody was going to get your book, I know you're already a best-selling author. So where can they find that at? And then where can they find you on social media if they want to hit you up, maybe get a consultation and learn more about publishing? For sure. So y'all can DM me on Instagram at underscore open mic night. If you leave out the underscore and type in open mic night, it'll still pop up. It's Mike, M-I-K-E. Um, and the night N-I-G-H-T. The book is on Amazon.com for now. Uh, gave Amazon one year for exclusive release so I can get those numbers up to be a bestseller, but it should be coming out on Barnes & Noble soon. But for now, you can get it at Amazon.com. If you type in music publishers, you ain't got to finish it. You know They know what you're talking about and it's going to pop right up. Got it. Got it. Well, I appreciate you once again for coming on, man. And I know we're going to link up soon in person. So look forward to that as well. But yeah, I appreciate you for the interview and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Appreciate you. Peace. Hope you guys enjoyed this interview. Mike dropped so many gems. And here's what I want to let you in on before we leave. If you want to make a minimum of $1,000 in the next 60 days, I guarantee it, then make sure you go and watch the free training. And if everything looks good on that, you'll have an opportunity to book a call with me and we'll talk about how you can make a thousand bucks a month minimum in your business. And you can do that in as little as 60 days. So imagine how that would help your life right now to learn how you can leverage that skill. So go watch the free training. And if everything looks good, book a call with me and I'll talk with you in person about how to scale your business.